Thank you to all our EPSMO participants. It's not easy to commit your time for the last few days and today. I appreciate your keen interest and your commitment to this uh, EPSMO for the year 2021. Today we have uh, Ambassador Chang Heng Chi. She is a well-known uh, dignitary in Singapore. We call her uh, intellectual, we call her uh, uh, ambassador at large, we call her uh, uh, whatever you can think of. Yeah. She holds many positions uh, publicly and um, these are all uh, available in the write-up about Ambassador Chang Heng Chi in the booklet that we have uh, provided for all EPSMO participants. Currently, she is chairman or chairperson of the Lee Kuan Yew Center for Innovative City. This is at the University of Technology and Design. We call it SUTD, Singapore University of Technology and Design. It's one of the uh, newest uh, higher institution, uh, institution of higher learning. So without further ado, um, she is actually going to speak to us on what we are seeing out there in the uh, regional and international scene. Yeah. In her role as a former ambassador of Singapore to the United States, she is well qualified to talk about the uh, United States of America and its external relations. In fact, she has been there for a long time. She was our ambassador in the US for 16, 17 years. And she is actually the longest serving Singapore ambassador to the United States. On top of that, because of her uh, academic background and her study of the regional and uh, international relations. She is familiar with China, with ASEAN, with almost every country in our Asia Pacific region. Yeah, so she is well qualified to uh, take us through the next uh, 30 to 45 minutes on what she calls Singapore in transition uh, in this uh, current uh, state of international uh, relations. Uh, globally. So I will now pass a screen to uh, Ambassador Chang Heng Chi. Uh, and then maybe after her verbal presentation, uh, we can uh, take some of the questions from participants of EPSMO. And I hope uh, we can uh, uh, give her the hardest question you can think of. She is, after all, our most esteemed diplomat from Singapore. Ambassador Chan Hengchi, over to you. Uh, thank you, Ken Yong. Uh, good morning to the distinguished participants. Have Can you hear me? Yeah. Right. Uh, the title of the lecture this morning is Singapore in Transition, Navigating the New Geopolitics and Geoeconomics in the Asia Pacific. I would say that, in fact, all the countries in the region are going through the same transition. Each country in ASEAN will have its own perspective. And I will share Singapore's perspective on the transition with you. Now, there is no way around saying that we face a most volatile and dangerous period today, especially in the second half of the 2021. I believe this because of three drivers pushing this situation. Firstly, the deepening and unrelenting US-China rivalry and competition for influence in the region and the world. We in the Asia Pacific or Indo-Pacific are going to be caught up with it, like it or not. Secondly, the American withdrawal from Afghanistan has set in motion consequences that will impact the security of the region. And thirdly, the COVID pandemic has devastated our economies and the global economy. How will it impact the geoeconomics of the region? 
How will it impact on geopolitics? The pandemic has become another arena, of course, for the US-China rivalry. And so how does Singapore, a small country, view all this? And how do we map a path for ourselves in this volatile world? Let me discuss each of these drivers in turn and conclude with what I think small countries and medium-sized countries can do. First of all, the deepening US-China rivalry. Over the last decade, the rivalry between the United States and China has been sharpening. So you ask your question, is the rivalry between the United States and China inevitable? My answer is yes. When the Soviet Union dissolved in 1992, the next nearest rival for the United States was China. But China was not then a peer rival, especially uh, was not then a peer rivalry, rival. But with China's economy performing spectacularly, especially after it was admitted into the WTO in 2001, it was a question of time before the United States would regard China as a strategic competitor. While rivalry and competition is inevitable, war is not. Let me recap briefly. During the Cold War, the United States and the Western Alliance focused on the Soviet Union as the main enemy. The Soviet Union was a peer competitor. China, just established as the People's Republic of China, was backward and poor. It was not industrialized. China was a war enemy for the US when it intervened in 1950 in Korea suddenly, pitting themselves against the Americans. But they withdrew back to China in a couple of months. Then China, together with the Soviet Union, was promoting revolution around the world. China supported North Vietnam in, in its war with the US to unify with the South. But by 1968, China was looking to improve its relationship with the United States because of Soviet troops along its borders. Nixon made a historic trip to China in 1972 and detente, as you know, was established as both powers found strategic congruence against a common foe, the Soviet Union. And in 1979, Deng Xiaoping visited the United States, met with President Carter, becoming the first Chinese paramount leader to visit the United States since 1943. But the warming relationship hit reality with Tiananmen in 1989. Tiananmen reminded the United States that China was a communist regime and authoritarian, and in their view, with little regard for human rights. This episode was soon followed by the beginning of the end of the Cold War. This meant that the United States no longer needed to work with China against the Soviet Union. Nonetheless, I would say, the United States followed a bipartisan policy of strategic engagement. Presidents Bush 41, Clinton, Bush 43, and President Obama engaged China. There were ups and downs in the bilateral relationship over human rights and Taiwan. But Americans thought with China entering WTO, signaling and opening up its evolution to a more open system and eventually democracy would follow. Most analysts date the sharply deteriorating relationship with Donald Trump's election in, as a 46th president and ascendance of Xi Jinping as president of China. But the deepening of rivalry came early, earlier when the deep economic recession hit the United States in 2008, turning into the global financial crisis. The American economy was in a tailspin. Chinese, China emerged relatively unscathed. Chinese banks were welcomed and going to Wall Street to bid for failing American banks and financial institutions. I was in Washington during this period. The loss of self-confidence in America was palpable. Even before that, the mood in the heartland was angry and despairing, believing that Asia, especially China, was eating their lunch. Of course, globalization and technological changes had wiped out 
jobs. Donald Trump turned China bashing into his election campaign message. It was around this time that the United States became aware that China had amassed critical military power, economic power, and political influence to seriously challenge the United States. And China under Xi Jinping was more assertive in its foreign policy, proposing initiatives like AIIB, BRI, and becoming increasingly active in the South China Sea, changing facts on the ground and in the East China Sea. And across strategic circles in the United States, China was now regarded as peer competitor of the, of the United States. Now, President Trump is highly competitive and was determined to show the way to deal with China was to play hardball. He raised tariffs to a level never before thought possible. And the trade war quickly included an investment war, then a technology war. In fact, the belief in the United States and in China is that the struggle for leadership and supremacy lies in technology. Threats of decoupling of the tech sector and the economies followed. Now, the Biden administration has surprised many by not changing President Trump's policies on China, but he pursued them more systematically and with coalition building. President Biden added a new dimension to the rivalry, a question of values. He is mobilizing Western allies and other countries in what his administration, he himself, sees as a struggle of democracies against authoritarian systems to demonstrate which can perform better. The Biden administration has argued that China is trying to spread the Chinese model around the world. Now, when values enter into the array of issues, it is sounding very much like a Cold War redux. For instance, Bill Burns, the director of CIA, in his confirmation hearings, told Congress that, and I quote, the greatest threat to the United States is China's efforts to spread its influence around the world, close quote. Now, it is clear this rivalry is about the struggle for dominance and supremacy in the world. And from what the Bill Burns said, there will be contestation and tension everywhere if the greatest threat is China's efforts to spread its influence around the world. Now, many analysts are passing it finally, arguing that what we see is not a Cold War. Cold War, not Cold War. They argue the independence, the interdependence of the economies, the need to work transitional issues like climate change will put some break on the rapidly descending relationship you know, into a Cold War. Now, in recent months, there has been some real concern in the United States, in some circles, and in Asia and Southeast Asia with the direction of these developments. Joe Nye, Joseph Nye, one of the leading strategic thinkers in the United States, is increasingly arguing for some sense to enter the strategic discussions. He is pushing for cooperative rivalry. And former Australian Prime Minister Kevin Rudd has also talked about strate managed strategic competition. And Robert Kagan, the well-known realist in international relations, has argued that the United States should take on China militarily but not push China so hard economically. Prime Minister Li Xianlong, my Prime Minister, has said in many speeches that the US and China should try to find a new equilibrium. He reminded the United States that countries in the region do not want to choose. The United States will not be able to find countries signing up for a containment policy. Now, in the region, the rivalry is escalating without pause. In fact, Southeast Asia and East Asia are the theaters of rivalry, where the United States and China will confront each other in the South China Sea and over Taiwan. 
The strategy in the region is to boast of the US, is to bolster its traditional bilateral defense treaty alliances with new alliances and groupings of like-minded countries. The Trump administration promoted the Free and Open Indo-Pacific, FOIP, to counter the Chinese BRI vision, Belt and Road vision. This was accompanied by the equal emphasis on the court. The court began its origins with maritime exercises between India and Japan and US. But in 2007, Prime Minister Abe wanted to create a quadrilateral to establish an Asian arc of democracy. Later, Australia joined in. The Biden administration now has further built on these two initiatives. The FOIP and Quad are viewed in ASEAN as groupings to contain China and have been slow to respond to their overtures to join or work with them in some ways. ASEAN feeling the pressure of FOIP has adopted its own version, the Indonesian initiative which is the ASEAN outlook on the Indo-Pacific, which is a more inclusive vision. Now with the Biden administration mobilizing its allies to deal with China's challenges, growing challenges, France, Germany, and the Netherlands have come out with their own individual versions of the FOIP, Free and Open Indo-Pacific. And in September, 2021, the European Union unveiled its version of the FOIP, taking in all what the other countries said. The, Uni the EU, European Union, clearly does not want to be left out of a dynamic and strategic region where it has cumulative investments. Its statement emphasized cooperation, not confrontation, and seeks multifaceted engagement with China. I quote their words, but it is also interested, the EU, in establishing a rules-based order respecting human rights. Thus, Europe has its own principles, but is more inclusive in its approach. Now, in the November 2020 Quad Foreign Ministers meeting, and this was during President Trump's time, even Australia and India tread carefully by talking of an inclusive region so as not to trigger off further tension with China. This was a meeting in Tokyo. But many developments have taken place since 2020, and Australia found itself under multiple economic sanctions from China, which was seen as economic coercion for calling for an inquiry into the origins of the Wuhan virus, and India had its border clash with China. Australia now has also taken tough policies against foreign interference targeted at China in Australian politics. The first Quad summit under Joe Biden, the first Quad, but it's the first Quad summit in March 2021 was held but it did not mention security and military matters and focused on the pandemic and the delivery of public goods, such as vaccines. The second court summit just held in Washington emphasized cooperation with FOIP, vaccine cooperation, technology cooperation, supply chain security in semiconductors and combating illegal fishing and raising maritime domain awareness. I believe they've also got a program for exchange of students under STEM education. Now, this court meeting in September held just after the United States, United Kingdom and Australia, three Anglosphere countries announced a security partnership. AUKUS was laden with meaning. Now, AUKUS is really a procurement agreement turned into a security part partnership, which is the nomenclature they use. 
but is written up as a security pact with all the fanfare in its introduction. It is an agreement to allow Australia to buy eight nuclear powered submarines, technology provided by the US, the building of the submarines by the UK. Many heralded this as writing, correcting the balance of forces in the region. Although China was not mentioned, it was all about China. AUKUS has raised many questions for ASEAN. Malaysia and Indonesia have voiced their concerns, starting with an arm race in the region. They fear that. And Malaysia was concerned with violating Zopfan and Sonfes, which are uh, cherished concepts in uh, the ASEAN region, though some people say the Sonfes nuclear free zone is, you know, uh, sort of held out there, but uh, there are many realists in ASEAN. Singapore's reaction was to strike a balanced tone. You know, we hope the architecture, new architecture will complement existing ASEAN, regional architecture and that it will play a constructive role in the peace and security of the region. The Philippines has welcomed this development. Japan, not surprisingly, welcomed AUKUS, but India has not publicly made a statement. Though I suspect privately at the court meeting in DC, they may have conveyed that position to the United States and to Australia. The two coming together, AUKUS and Quad, was viewed as a show of strength by US-led allies coalition. But AUKUS raises the question, whether the United States sees the Quad as not able to do the heavy lifting militarily. Under the Trump administration, we know that the Secretary of State, uh, Mike Pompeo, was hinting at the Quad becoming an ASEAN NATO. And that was what made many ASEAN countries pull back. Some have asked the question whether AUKUS means that the US is getting its allies to do burden sharing by beefing up equipment. And they hope it is not the first step for the United States to lighten its defense footprint in the future. Now, if the United States does this elsewhere, like you know, withdraw from the scene, I do not think the US will withdraw from the Indo-Pacific and East Asia because of the dynamics in the region and because of China. So AUKUS is not a sign of the US lightening its footprint in the region. That's my view, you know. I think it's Singapore's view. The US-China rivalry is also causing some other development. It's forcing a decoupling of technology. It is a whole subject which I will not go into because of lack of time and I'm not the clear technology expert. But if the United States began by seeking to decouple from China, China now wants to decouple from the United States to control the narrative and to do it on its own terms and in their own way. The Trump administration set out to tighten China's access to US technology through the FIRMA legislation which made it much more difficult, if impossible, for China to buy technology firms in the United States. The scrutiny started during the Obama administration, but under Trump, the United States was also denying Chinese companies access to its capital markets or on conditions that are very tough. To tougher scrutiny and transparency was demanded. China has also now moved in the same way. China is discouraging its companies from listing in the US stock market. The recent war on tech giants in China showed the Chinese government's understanding that the, of the wider implications of the full extent of the power of data and technology, probably from the United States, they learned this, through the congressional hearings on Google, Facebook, and Microsoft, 
And they must have been shocked when they learned that Twitter could just shut down President Trump's account. Can you imagine that, you know? So today, decoupling has gone quite far along. The United States has refused to give access to many Chinese technology firms to buy the technology they need in software and hardware. The US leads China in many areas of technology, but China is catching up fast, particularly in some areas. And in publications and patents on AI, they are becoming the leader. In fact, Biden has followed Trump's policies. This has forced China to prepare for self-reliance in technology. I think they waited. Trump, Biden didn't change policy. So I, they've gone, in fact, for self-reliance in technology. The US is actively seeking to get countries to exclude Chinese technologies like Huawei, 5G, and ZTE to build the infrastructure in their countries. So will there be two technology systems? And Biden seems to be interested to nurture an alliance of techno democracies. But for Southeast Asia, I think the countries would not want to be boxed in because China is their most important trading partner. So will ASEAN be forced to choose sooner rather than later? Now, experts who understand technology better than I have indicated that the production of a notebook or mobile phone is so complex, it is hard to account where components are coming from. Apple has many of their devices produced in China. HP and Dell have major productions of their notebook in China. I think they doubt a complete decoupling can take place. In fact, it is widely known that about 30, some would say 35% of the US semiconductor industry exports go to China. Without the Chinese market, this will weaken the profits of these semiconductor companies and therefore impact on their R&D. But China is now facing up to the need to enhance its semiconductor industry so that they will not be cut off. It is also a fact that China's consumption represents up to 25% of global demand in servers, networking, PC, and smartphone products. And the country's consumption of technology products is increasing twice as fast as the global average. So this is in fact, a huge market. The earlier discussion of supply chain had analysts arguing that ASEAN could benefit from the US-China tensions, and that was in 2019-2020. Indeed, some firms from China, both the United States and Chinese and Japanese, have moved some of their factories out of China to produce in Vietnam. And some companies were said to have gone to Malaysia and even Indonesia. But in reality, ASEAN cannot replace China. We do not have the numbers nor depth of expertise and skills to be the substitute. ASEAN also will want to work with both the United States and China, seeking access to both enormous markets. Now, let me talk of the second driver in this whole shaping of the geopolitics and geoeconomics. I will discuss the consequences of US withdrawal from Afghanistan. Now, President Biden made it clear that he was withdrawing from Afghanistan because he wanted to focus on the Indo-Pacific and China. Withdrawal from the forever wars was a decision most Americans support. The country, America, wants the government to turn to creating jobs, building infrastructure, fixing the healthcare system and education and all the domestic problems that are dividing America now. 
However, the rapid collapse of the Afghan government and the swift takeover by the Taliban forces ushering in fear and despair among the people and havoc at the airport caused reputational damage to the United States. President Biden faced tough criticisms from his NATO allies and Congress, I should say, particularly Congress. Reports suggest more people were, have been evacuated, but it is unclear if everyone who should be evacuated has left. American commentators and analysts were the first to suggest that the manner of the US withdrawal severely dented American credibility. Americans said this first. But I would argue that the United States is likely to recover its image. Remember Vietnam in 1975? It took the United States a few years to recover, and it happened first in ASEAN, when it joined forces in ASEAN with ASEAN and China to push back Vietnam after it invaded Cambodia. This was 1979. So from 75 and 79, there was some recouping already. Then there was a first Gulf War that left no doubt among many of the American ability to shock and awe with its military might. After that, the Soviet Union also imploded and the United States established itself as the world's hegemon. Then the United States entered a period of unilater unilateralism with some unfortunate consequences. So this gives you an idea of you know, the possibility of recovery. Now, during Vice President Kamala Harris's visit to Singapore, journalists questioned whether the region believed in American commitment after Afghanistan and in its credibility. Prime Minister Lee, my Prime Minister, answered the question in this way, and I quote him in full. He said, and this is it, what will influence perceptions of US resolve and commitment to the region will be what the US does going forward, how it repositions itself in the region and how it engages in its broad, its broad range of friends and partners and allies and how it continues to fight against terrorism. Countries make calculations and take positions and they have to make recalculations and adjust their policies from time to time. Perhaps it can be, do be done smoothly. Sometimes there are hiccups. Sometimes things go awry and take time to put right. But countries remain with long-term interests with long-term partners. And it is a mark of a country which can succeed that it takes its interests and partners seriously and in a dispassionate way and maintains them over the long term, unquote. That is Prime Minister Lee. Now, there is one consequence of the new Afghanistan that concerns many in the Asia Pacific. It is feared by analysts that the Taliban victory will embolden terrorists globally. It is a known fact that ISISK, ISIS-K is very active in Afghanistan and that the Al-Qaeda are operating with Taliban. <coughs> the bombing at Kabul airport brought notice to the ISIS-K present, ISIS-K presence. Ali Sofan, the former FBI counterterrorism agent, wrote in Washington Post that, and I quote him, a new, more dangerous phase has begun, unquote. He fears Afghanistan will become a hub for terrorism again. Citing a UN report, he said there are 8,000 to 10,000 foreign fighters in Afghanistan from the Arab world, Central Asia, and Uyghur areas of China. Monitoring of Islamist communications on social media and the chat rooms indicate that groups from Syria and Southeast Asia 
began redirecting pro potential recruits to Afghanistan. In Southeast Asia, we have a recent history with the JI, J Jamaya Islamia, Jamaya Islamia and other terrorist groups. I think governments will be on the alert to spot any rekindling and support from ISIS or AI for militant terrorism in their countries. And intelligence cooperation will be crucial, including assistance from the United States. The question is whether the United States will be able to focus its attention to deal with the challenges of China and Russia as the Biden administration hopes to. I believe the US will pay great attention to East Asia, but it will also be focusing attention on terrorism and the instability in Northwest Asia willy-nilly, especially in case terrorism visits the US again. It will also be monitoring human rights in Afghanistan as it could be an issue used against Biden by the Republicans. So the United States will not be able to devote all its attention to one spot, not even East Asia. Now, how will Afghanistan impact on India? India is a member of the Quad and is interested in managing the rise of China. India has always looked west to Kashmir, Pakistan, and Afghanistan. <clears throat> if it has embraced the Quad, and is looking east, it is because of its clash with China over its border. <clears throat> the rise of the Taliban in Afghanistan will once again force India to look west. It will be concerned with terrorism, encouraged in their view by Pakistan and the Taliban. And they fear this in Kashmir. They also fear terrorism in India. India will not want to concede influence in Afghanistan to Pakistan. In fact, for the free and open Indo-Pacific, my expectation is that India will be more focused on Indo than Pacific. Now, will China and Russia be able to step into the vacuum left by the US after withdrawal after Afghanistan, Pakistan, and in Central Asia? I think China will work cautiously with the Taliban government because it wants to secure its borders from terrorism and is concerned that the Uyghur terrorists do not find a safe haven in Afghanistan. It is quite another thing to fill the vacuum. It is unlikely Russia will allow the United States to establish bases in Central Asia in their backyard. The US had temporary bases in Uzbekistan, which closed, which was closed in 2005, and Kyrgyzstan, which was closed in 2014. And this was after it was established in, after 9-11, so that the US could pursue the war on terrorism. We can expect the United States will be watching this area. It is a huge swath of territory. And China's interest in Central Asia is its BRI projects and also terrorism. They are also concerned, as with Russia, with radical Islam crossing the borders of Afghanistan and the states of Central Asia to their countries. Now, let me deal with the third driver impacting on the geopolitics and geoeconomics of the Asia Pacific. I think that COVID pandemic, you know, has been a great factor. The COVID pandemic, which was the most devastating health threat in recent times, have brought together the world together in multilateral efforts to deal with this global disaster. Instead, it has become another platform for the US and China to conduct its rivalry. There is more interest to play the blame game than to find relief and assistance for stricken countries. And nationalism has affected every country in the way they have reacted with vaccines. 
In 2020, it was clear that China emerged as the competent government, able to get the virus under control and manage the economic recovery. In 2020, China reported a growth rate of 2.3%, according to the World Bank, compared to other countries which were reporting negative growth. It is expected to do a 8.5% growth rate or near that range for 2021, before falling back to 5.4% in 2022. Now, China was quick to provide Sinovac vaccines to the region and many countries in Latin America and Africa, and even Europe. It was pointed out, however, that their wolf warrior diplomacy negated much of the goodwill they won. Now, in 2020, China and other and 15 other countries also signed the reset agreement. So all in all, I think 2020 was a good year for China. The United States under the Trump administration shocked the world with its incompetence and anti-science approach. President Joe Biden's rapid rollout of the vaccination program restored some of the reputation lost. In moving rapidly to mobilize his Western allies and his many security initiatives, attending NATO, the NATO summit, G7, FOIP, the Quad and AUKUS, I think President Biden managed to demonstrate America is back. And it has been noted that President Trump pulled the US out of CPTPP and the Biden administration has not made moves to rejoin nor come to the region with any trade or economic initiatives. In fact, Catherine Tai is USTR just made a big speech on trade at CSIS. And you know, there was a lot of disappointment all around because uh, nothing much was said about trade except that they will renegotiate the trade one. Uh, you know, they will see to the implementation of the phase one trade of the earlier uh, deal that the Trump administration had negotiated. Now, for the US and its allies, deterrence is seen largely in military terms. But while military aspects are necessary, they are not sufficient to win strong support from the region, the region of Southeast Asia generally, and even some parts of Northeast Asia. The region is clearly looking for trade and investment to follow. And that is not coming anytime fast, though the United States says it's, once it's finished its review on China, it, it will in fact start making its moves. And of course now China has put in its application for CPTPP. So let me now ask the question, how is Singapore positioning itself in this great power rivalry? Singapore, like many ASEAN countries, does not want to choose. But is that possible? It is getting harder and harder, as many have said. We continue to be even-handed when dealing with both the United States and China. And this was seen just this year we welcomed U.S. Secretary of Defense uh, Lloyd Austin in July. Vice President Kamala Harris visited us in August, and Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi paid an official visit a couple of weeks ago to Singapore. And we have welcomed China's application to CPTPP. In fact, for a long time, Singapore leaders have in public forums mentioned this, that it would be good if China, if China chooses to uh, join CPTPP, CPTPP, Singapore would support this move. And Singapore leaders have in public forums urged both powers to find a new equilibrium. But we still do not want to choose. We believe many small and medium-sized countries feel the same. They have to find a new equilibrium and Singapore has suggested that there would be a necessary adjustment that has to be made.
to the new power. And Prime Minister Lee at the Shangri-La Dialogue in 2019 said, and the United States being the largest country of all has to make the most adjustment. Now, if there were to emerge a number of countries who argue they would like to remain in the third space, not choosing, not having to choose. And this group is not institutionalized, not pushing an agenda, but all seeking to act according to their own sovereign interests, I think they could create for themselves an important maneuvering space. Singapore has not articulated this, but I believe this is how we see this going forward. Thank you.